Good evening and thank you everyone for joining us today. I am Amit Saxena along with my colleague Dr. Deepika Chabra from Medical Services. Jackson Power Pharmaceuticals are pleased to welcome you all to this daily PG forum presentation by postgraduates of ESI PGIMSR Basai Darapur, New Delhi. This is a knowledge sharing initiative of Jackson Power Pharmaceuticals, makers of maintained injection hydroxyprogesterone 250 and 500 milligrams, cyclorex CR 10 milligram tablets of navarathisterone, and Divatron, our newly launched 10 milligram tablet of didogesterone. We would like to express our gratitude and warm and hearty welcome to all the esteemed experts and attendees. We kindly request you to post your questions, suggestions, clarifications in the chat box or q and box. This webinar is streaming live on Facebook and the link is already being shared in the chat box for circulation. Please note this will be sharing the, uh, the link of this will be sharing the YouTube for future purpose. The coordinator of today's program is for Delhi PG forums are Dr. Sunita Malik. And I request Dr. Sunita Malik, ma'am, to kindly initiate the session. Uh, basically, today we have a class or a discussion on abnormal uterine bleeding. So as the all the PGs who know that it's a common clinical entity and it affects around 15 to 25% of the women attending OPD. Uh, Dr. Ma Dr. Malik has joined. Dr. Malik, madam, please take over. Yeah. Good evening, uh, as uh, Dr. Charu has just introduced the topic, this is a very important topic for postgraduate students and AUB can come in any time and they should be knowing the management, especially in reproductive age, you know, maximum hysterectomies are being done for this particular condition and whether indicated or not indicated, this is what we are going to discuss. What is the medical management, how to go about it, so that's what it, it is. So for today's session, we have is Dr. Deepti Goswami. Me? Dr. Deepti Goswami is the director, professor, and unit head in uh, Mulana Azad Medical College. And uh, she has done her Commonwealth scholarship in University College London Hospital in reproductive medicine also. And uh, she's got many publications and is a well-known and very good orator. Dr. Deepti Goswami. Our next chairperson is Dr. Taru Gupta, who was, who is head of uh, ESI PGI um, uh, MSR, Masai Darapur. She is, uh, also has many achievements and awards in her uh, name, and she has got many publications also. Her field of interest is high-risk pregnancy, endoscopic surgery, and gynae oncology. The moderators for today's session are Dr. Pratiksha Gupta, she's professor in Basai Darapur, ESI Hospital. She also has many awards and publication. Her interest or areas are endoscopy and trainer in ESI Hospital. The next moderator is Dr. Deepshika Deswal. She's assistant professor in ESI PJMSR Basai Darapur. Her area of interest is high risk pregnancy and has got many publications. A young assistant professor. <laughs> And uh, the next chairperson, uh, moderator is Dr. Maruti Sina. She is consultant of in gynae in, uh, and infertility specialist and endoscopic surgeon in charge family planning in Kasturba Hospital in Delhi. And she also has many publications and speaker in national and international conferences. And the PGs for today are Syama Mohan and Shipra Raj Verma. They are from ESI hospital only, third year DNP residents, uh, sorry, MD uh, residents. They're going to present today's case. So over to you, Dr. Taru and your team. Once again, I welcome all the attendees. So as we were discussing that abnormal uterine beating is a common clinical entity and it has significant impact on the physical, social, emotional and material quality of life. So now, as we know that the definition of AUB has been changed in the recent times, and we need to have a structured approach to establish the cause of uh, AUB. And definitely with increasing availability of medical options. So it has expanded the choices for women so that now the surgery is not only the uh, treatment modality available for AUB. 
So now with this short uh, introduction, I welcome our PG students, Dr. Sharma Mohan and Dr. Shipra, to start their case presentation. And I hope it would be very beneficial for all the attending PG students. Thank you, ma'am. Best of luck. Thank you. Hope you answer all the questions of all both the moderators. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Our case presentation is AUB and Reproductive Age Group. I'm Dr. Shipranaj Verma. I'm Dr. Shama. Here we are presenting the case. Yes, your slides are visible. Okay. Start now? Yeah, please start. Thank you, ma'am. Mrs. A, wife of Mr. B, resident of Basai Darapur, is a 32-year-old housewife by occupation, belongs to lower middle class according to modified Kokuswami scale. She presented with the chief complaint of heavy menstrual bleeding and painful menses since two years. History of presenting illness. Patient was apparently asymptomatic two years back. Later, she developed prolonged and heavy menstrual bleeding during regular menstrual cycle, which was in serious and onset, lasting for eight to 10 days. She used to change four to five pads per day as compared to previous cycle of two to three pads per day. It was associated with passage of clots and heaviness in the lower abdomen and also with lower abdomen pain during menses. Painful menstrual cramps last for four to five days, starting with the menses, which were intermittent, dull aching, non-radiating, and was relieved on taking medications. History of, there is history of increased urinary frequency, no history of discharge per vagina, no history of intermenstrual bleeding or post bleeding. There is no history of fever, fatigue, loss of appetite, or significant weight loss. Menstrual history, age of menarche, 13 year old. Last menstrual period, 17th October, 2022. Past cycles were regular of three, three to four days. Normal flow, no dysmenorrhea, used two to three pads per day and cycle was 20 to 30 days duration. Present cycle, eight to 10 days, heavy flow with passage of clots. Dysmenorrhea, the starting, starting of menses since two years using four to five pads fully soaked per day. Obstetric history, married life for 10 years, which was non-consagrous marriage. His paramount life one, the previous cesarean eight years back. The pre pregnancy event was uneventful. The puerperial period was uneventful. Baby is alive and healthy. Coming to past history, there is no history of any heavy menstrual bleeding or dysmenorrhea since menarche. No history of acne, hirsutism, excessive hair growth. No history of hypertension, diabetes, tuberculosis, or seizure disorder. There is no history of cold or heat intolerance, fatigue, weight loss, or weight gain. No history of any bleeding disorder. No history of chronic medication intake. No history of renal disorder. No history of any prolonged hospitalization. There is no history of family history. No history of chronic illness in family. No history of any malignancy. Personal history, mixed diet, appetite normal, sleep adequate. There is history of increased frequency of bladder symptoms. No history of any tobacco, alcohol, or any other substance intake. Contraception history, she used barrier contraception. No use of any hormonal contraception or any intrauterine contraception device. Treatment history, patient was not compliant, visited on and off in gynec casualty and not, not on any regular medication. Uh, I'm covering, coming to general physical examination. The patient is moderately built and average nourished. Patient is well oriented to time, place and person. Patient is cooperative and examined with an adequate exposure after taking a consent. Her body weight was 62 kg with a height of 158 cm, giving a BMI of 24.84 kg per meter square. On examination, there was pallor, which was clinically a 5 to 6 gram person. Ictus was absent. Cyanosis was absent. There was no clubbing. There was no lymphadenopathy and there was no edema. There was no acne or hirsutism present. On oral examination, it was normal. Thyroid examination was normal. 
on breast examination bilateral breast was or were of same size soft with no discharge no induration or no lump palpable coming to the vitals of the patient the pulse rate were 101 beat, beats per minute bp 120 by 80 mm hg respiratory rate 17 per minute and she was a febrile to touch on systemic examination cardiovascular examination heart sounds s1 and s2 were heard normally and there was no murmur on respiratory examination normal vesicular breath sounds were heard equally on both sides with no added sounds on central nervous system examination it was normal sensory and motor functions coming to abdominal examination on inspection the shape and size of the abdomen was slightly distended below the umbilicus the umbilicus central and flat all quadrants were moving equally with the respiration peninsteel incision scar was seen over the supra pubic area there were no sinuses no dilated veins no visible pulsations over the abdomen all the hernial sites were free palpation no guarding no tenderness or rigidity felt a mass is felt in the midline arising from the pelvis size corresponding to 24 weeks size gravid uterus firm in consistency with irregular surface and irregular margins mobile from side to side and lower pole could not be reached on percussion the dull note were heard over over the mass in auscultation normal bowel sounds were heard pelvic examination inspection and palpation of the external genitalia vulva and vagina looks normal on per speculum examination there was minimal bleeding pv present but the cervix and the vagina seemed healthy by manual examination a mass of 24 weeks size gravid uterus felt arising from the uterus moves with cervix and vice versa and there is no cleft or groove felt in between the mass and the uterus the mass was firm in consistency with irregular margins on per rectal examination the rectal mucosa was free with no abnormal with no abnormalities and the same was was felt during per rectal examination also provisional diagnosis 32 year old female p1 l1 belongs to lower middle class with severe anemia with uh, aub with history suggestive of a fibroid uterus our differential diagnosis includes aub a adenomyosis and some ovarian tumor just a thing why uh, what can be history you said the uh, aub with history suggestive of fibroid uterus why do you say history why not your examination मैम more important you have given one uh, this thing frequency of urination frequency of urination is yes, so uh, that if you uh, and of course be uh, in history uh, nothing else is suggestive other than your menstrual periods right yes, so okay and in the differential diagnosis uh, uh, you are saying uh, adenomyosis right yes, so uh, how would you uh, differentiate between adenomyosis and uh, fibroid ma'am usually the adenomyosis uh, usually the adenomyosis don't grow up to this size of the mass because we are having a 24 weeks gravid uh, uterus and um, uh, this mass palpable with irregular margins that won't be there in adenomyosis and usually fibroid uterus don't grow to the size in the case of adenomyosis ma'am yeah also it would not be so irregular as you are uh, repeatedly stressing that very irregular mass so adenomyosis is usually a smooth mass right yes. so in your uh, examination this is all that you can uh, comment upon so yes. okay and if you thought it was in ovarian ma'am uh, with the mass if we take it as uh, if the lump we take it as a uh, uh, we can have a ovarian tumor but normally ovarian tumors doesn't present with menorrhage menstrual complaints so 
Yeah, and also yeah, you would it's probably it's feel the uterus separately, no? Yes, ma'am. There is a groove felt in between the uh, mass and ovarian mass and the uterus. Also, the side to side mobility is also present in the ovarian or the uterus. How would you confirm your diagnosis? Ma'am, uh, on investigation, uh, pregnancy is first the rule out, UTK is negative, blood group B positive, hemoglobin 4.2 gram percent. Total leukocyte count 6200 per microliter, platelet count 2.8 lakh, the LFT and liver function test and uh, renal function test are within the limit, bleeding time 60 seconds, and clotting time is four, was 4 minutes 30 seconds, prothrombin time was 14.4, and INR is 1.05, serum uh, TSH 2.2, chest x ray. Uh, normal study, ECG within normal limits, viral markers non-reactive, blood sugar, fasting, yes, 96. Shipra, wait. See, yes, I ma. asked you, how will you confirm your diagnosis? This is a battery of investigations. No, you will not do it before. You confirm it before. How would you confirm? What all investigations would you advise to this patient? Ma'am, first, first of all, we will uh, we will uh, Rule out any coagulopathy, ma'am. First of all, we will rule out any pregnancy, ectopic, molar pregnancy. Uh, did did the patient had a history of amenorrhea? No, ma'am. But what do we do routinely patient? Ka? Ma'am, complete blood count with platelet count. Role of imaging. What do you do with patient? Ma'am, yes, ma Ma'am, we'll the uh, first line of uh, imaging us uh, as an ultrasound, ma'am. Hmm. Get a trans abdominal or a trans vaginal ultrasound is the first. Uh, Since first this line patient is having 24 week size, you will go ahead with both a trans abdominal scan and a trans vaginal scan. Okay. What yes, all do you look for in the ultrasound? Dr. Madhuti, you will do it because Dr. Pratiksha is not able to do it. No, I have to hear you. I have to hear Going uh, systematically as a person would go, so they are partially correct in saying that they would do all these investigations and not directly go to the uh, ultrasound. Maybe that would be yeah. the next slide. Okay, so proceed, uh, Shama. Go to are your you next. Excuse me. You you there is one thing you have to differentiate between ovarian tumor and fibroid uterus. Now I want to know the differential. Differential point on examination, what they have said. Uh, step, uh, first point, during examination, during examination, per abdominal examination. How can we differentiate? This is an ovarian tumor and this is fibroid with the suprapubic intra-abdominal lump. Yes, start, Shama. Uh, ma'am, uh, the, the surface of the uterus, ma'am, with irregular, normally the ovarian masses will be smooth, having smooth surfaces. And so the consistency true. and the consistency, firm consistency is seen in uh, both are suprapubic intra-abdominal lump. Okay. Yes, yes, Second, this is the differentiating point we haven't taken. Now, now, ma'am, uh, yes, consistency yes. of the ma'am consistency, consistency, firm, yes. in, firm. How do you differentiate? Firm and fibroid, ma'am. It's a very firm mass. Okay, for, for, mm -hmm. for, yes, much firmer in fibroid. Yes, and need anything about mobility? Ma'am, side yes. to side mobility and lower pole of the mass can, uh, be, reached. can be reached in a way. Side to side mobility will be present in which mass? Ovarian, fibroid, or both? Both, ma'am. Both, ma both, okay. And then? Lower pole of the mass, ma'am. Lower pole yes. of the mass. Yes, yeah. Mm. Very true. Lower pole of the mass will be felt in fibroid or mm. ovarian. 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 If, uh, if it is not impacted. Okay. Mm -hmm. And and surface? Smooth. Well, uh, uh, comparatively, uh, we'll be having a smooth surface. Mm -hmm. Which one? Fibroid. Fibroid will be having a smooth surface. But in your case, you haven't, you're not having a smooth surface. It is bosselated. It is irregular. Margins are also irregular. Okay. Yes, ma'am. And anything else? It can be felt in between the uterus and the ovarian. Okay. To, towards one of the ilex fossa can be felt if uh, ovarian uh, tumor is restricted to one 
ovary or it is not impacted in middle okay and i think most and if it is adenomyosis adenomyosis and fibroiditis adenomyosis doesn't grow beyond how many weeks 12 weeks, 12 weeks. it could be 12 to 14 weeks okay so differentiate between uh, uh between adenomyosis mass um, adenomyosis and fibroiditis 14 weeks both are 14 weeks now differentiating features are on examination sir Mom, yes. Surface, smooth surface of the disc will be there in adenomyosis. Yeah, irregularities mm -hmm. won't be felt in adenomyosis, and irregularities will be felt in can be felt in fibroid. Okay. Second, second. Hello. Okay, maybe tenderness in the adenomyosis then. Ha, huh, tenderness will be present. Yes. Then. Of a fibroid. Not tenderness is felt in fibroid also. Why would you yes, have? Yes, if it is degenerated, that's what I was coming. It can it can be present if it is degenerating, and only if degeneration is there, which is not very usual. Ah. So I don't think you can have much tenderness either in a fibroid or in a denomyosis. Hmm. 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 Then, what about mobility in a denomyosis? Restricted mobility. Might be yes. Might be. Or oh, and in fibroid, uh, it can be more. Can you be a bit louder, Ashana? We are unable to hear. Mm -hmm. Ma'am, uh, mobility of the mass, ma'am. Mm hmm. Yes, mobility. Ma'am, in adenomyosis, there is restricted restricted mobility than fibroid. Okay. This is for abdominal examination. रीजन any other question or we go to the next investigation yeah now go to the investigation sir so as was being rightly pointed out this is one of your most important investigation when you are suspecting a fibroid right mm -hmm. so okay what did you get in the ultrasound Ma'am, on ultrasound whole abdomen, which was done in the month of September, uh, the uterus was bulky, measuring fourteen into eleven centimeter, with posterior wall intramural fibroid of around nine point eight into eight point four centimeter, and another anterior wall intramural fibroid of three point two into two point eight centimeter, which was intending to the endometrium. Um, the rest liver, gallbladder, kidney, pancreas, spleen, peritoneal cavity, urinary urinary bladder appear normal. On a TV scan, which was done in the month of October, the uterus was bulky with 11.8 into 8.3 into 14.8 centimeter heterogeneous mass originating from posterior wall of uterus and displacing the endometrium. So, can I just interrupt you once? Yes. Uh, you have you have told me that uh, the mass was on the posterior surface of the uterus, right? Yes, Where it is in your history, you told me there was frequency in uh, urine. So should it not have been an, uh, I mean, an anterior wall fibroid which could have disturbed the? Uh... Um, um, on MRI, it was a right lateral fibroids were also seen. It was missed. I think it was missed in the abdominal yes, scan. It was subjective. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. MRI, there were fi further fibroids. That means on transvaginal sonography, only one fibroid was seen. Yes, ma'am. Okay, and but the MRI reveals the other multiple, multiple fibroids. Okay. So, uh, why why did we feel the need to do an MRI? Ma'am, excuse me, ma'am. 
Why did you go for MRI? Why did you go for MRI? Ma'am, uh, she belongs to a reproductive age group, and uh, she is and uh, she is complaining of pre uh, pressure symptoms like uh, increased frequency urination. So we want to map the fibroid. So for the sake of fibroid mapping, we did an uh, MRI. Ma fibroid mapping for what? For what a myomectomy. For a myomectomy. For a myomectomy. So you were planning a myomectomy in her because of her young age. Or uh, incomplete family. Did she want more children? Uh, she wanted to preserve her fertility, ma'am. Mm. She is only L one. She is having mm. one living child. Yeah, she yeah. want. She want more children. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. She wants to. She wanted to preserve her fertility, ma'am. Mm. Okay. That's right. Okay. She was planning for future pregnancies, right? So that's why you went for an MRI. Should yes. you be? routinely going for an mri when uh, you are uh, diagnosing a fibroid on ultrasound no ma'am in a uh, elder uh, like slightly one person who is in a family or uh, who doesn't want further children ma'am uh, in this case there is a 24 week gravid uterus and per abdomen examination and also she is having irregular surface and irregular margins this is suggest for multiple fibroids plus she is having pressure symptoms so in this case we went for mri uh, otherwise for uh, every patients we don't we won't go for suppose, MRI. suppose this patient was 42 years or 43 years say and she was not in matlab uh, she has completed her family will you go for mri what what madam means that give this answer <laughs> She is planned for TH. We so will go for MRI or not? No, routinely we do, we do not. We, we don't know. Do. 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 Yeah. Because uh, because you know uh, ultrasound gives you a very good picture in hmm. cases of fibroid. So yeah. why uh, expose the patient to an MRI without any need? Or right. unless we are planning another indication of MRI is another one in, one more indication other than mapping. Ma'am, if there is, the, uh, if we want to rule out between fibro fibroid or adenomyosis, we can. No. Yes, yes. Adenomyosis or fibroid. If you are planning for a myomectomy. Yes. Myomectomy. Okay. Mm. Sometimes also, if we are thinking of embolization, right? Then also mm. we do an MRI. Then also we do it. Okay. So these are the two, three indications where we decide to go for an MRI, right? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Next. Ma'am, uh, MRI pelvis full abdomen, which was done in the month of October for the same patient. The uterus was bulky with a 10 into 13 into 15 centimeter, a well defined T1 iso intense and T2 hypo, T2 hypo intense lesion of 79 into 117 into 108 mm is made in the posterior myometrial wall. The lesion is involving the fundus and body of the uterus and displacing the endometrium. Another similar intensity lesion of around 46 into 78 into 82 mm is noted in the anterior myometrial wall along with the right lateral aspect. Few tiny anterior wall intramural fibroids were also noted, largest measuring 31 to 36 into 13 mm. ET was around 6 mm, well visualized in the frontal superior aspect of the body region, which was displaced with the above said uh, fibroid. The cervix was around 31 mm, uh, uh, vaginal walls were unremarkable. And no free fluid in the cul de sac and bilateral ovaries were mad. So, uh, what, uh, how do you explain the excessive bleeding that the patient was having? What, what was causing it in this particular case, your case? Ma'am, in case of uh, fibroids, the bleeding, excessive bleeding was caused by the large surface area, the large surface area, and during the bleeding, the myometrial contractions are not uh, complete. So this cause, this is the main cause of bleeding in a patient, uh, patients with AUB mm. Yeah, because uh, as per your finding, not there is not much of indenting of the uh, endometrium. So basically, the uh, large surface area is the problem because mm. you have a big fibroid. So that was the reason why she's why the patient was uh, having um, bleeding. Plus, uh, you have already uh, you have ruled out coagulopathies in this case. Yes, ma'am. Mm. Yes, ma'am. Okay. So then we go for the yes, next slide.
32 year old coming to the diagnosis 32 year old female p1 l1 belongs to lower middle class with severe anemia with aub p0 a0 l1 m0 c0 a0 1 i0 e0 and n0 okay so that is the uh, new classification of aub right so then uh, i think have you you finished with your case so we can come to my questions yes ma'am we have finished with our case to show this slide my question yes ma'am so okay my first question is that if we take the definition of dysfunctional uterine bleeding from our times right does your case qualify as a case of dysfunctional uterine bleeding Mm, no, ma'am. Actually, the name of dysfunctional uterus bleeding was we okay. obsolete in this in, in now. We only use the term abnormal uterine bleeding. Okay, so every no, no. Previous definition so is it obsolete. Bleeding. Are you sure, ma'am? We don't use much. Can we use the term AUB? Please talk louder. We can't hear you. Um, ma'am, it's a much less preferred, much pre less preferred term, ma'am. AUB. AUB is a more preferred term. Uh, uh, more than that, uh, something else like uh, okay, previous earlier see from the time we have been learning uh, uh, gynecology, we know that dysfunctional uterine bleeding is what we considered uh, what you are saying AUB now. Mm -hmm. But now lately, Figo has revised all these. Can you show? Um, yeah, go to my next slide. show the figo classification you want the figo classification yeah. so yeah. as you can see that now abnormal uh, any abnormal bleeding from the genital tract in the absence of any demonstrable local or systemic organic disease was the earlier definition of dub right mm -hmm. but now we have included everything all these structural organic causes non organic causes functional causes everything mm -hmm. but still dub has a place even now the Oh, the ovulatory part in the palm coin uh, classification is now the dysfunctional uterine bleeding, which we used to consider earlier. Okay. So, uh, go to my next question. Then I'll ask you about the palm coin. So, the new definition of AUB and uh, how it has changed from the old, as we just discussed, how it has changed. So, what is the new definition? The new definition is uh, for the normal uterine bleeding, excessive menstrual bleeding in the genital tract, uh, which is deviated from uh, uh, from the uh, normal regularity, frequency, amount, and duration. Yes. So uh, you can quantify or expand this definition. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Ma'am, uh, the Do frequency. Ma'am, the frequency of the normal cycle is twenty four to thirty eight days. If mm -hmm. it is less than twenty four days, it is frequent cycle. And if it is and more, if it is more than thirty eight days, it is infrequent cycle. Okay, so uh, please go on to my next slide. Where let us show the palm coin uh, classification. So, and also, as I said, what do you understand by characterization of normal and abnormal limits of menstruation? So, there are three aspects to it, right? You just told me one. The what all? Three aspects to it. And second is the, uh, the uh, amount of bleeding, amount of blood loss. The normal is considered five to eighty mL of blood loss. If it is less than, if it is absent or no bleeding, it is amenorrhea. If it is more than eighty mL, it is considered as heavy menstrual bleeding. Right. So that is the quantity. What about the cycle frequency? Mm -hmm. Cycle frequency. Mm -hmm. Ma'am, the cycle variant is there, ma'am. From one cycle to the other, the we mean that there is a slide. There is a slide of it. Can, can you put on the slide? Ah, uh, uh, my slide. Put on the slide. Yeah. Ma'am, uh, the regularity of the cycle, the cycle to cycle variation, which is taken over the period of twelve months. So it is absent. We call it as an amenorrhea. When it is regular, it be, uh, it is a plus minus two to twenty days. If it is irregular, it is more than twenty days in cycle uh, uh, regularity of the cycle, cycle to cycle variation. The duration of the flow, the duration of the flow, we take it as a normal duration is four to eight days. Prolonged is more than eight days, and shortened is less than four days, ma'am. Okay. 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 Okay.
So, uh, right, this is the Pigo's characterization of a normal uh, menstruation. So, that is how we would quantify a normal from an abnormal. So, it is very important to understand that what is normal and what is abnormal. Only then we can say it is an abnormal uterine bleeding, right? Mm -hmm. So, now uh, go to the next slide. We can see how abnormal uterine bleeding uh, no, before that, you must be having the uh, my slide of abnormal uterine bleeding, palm point. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. So now you can explain. You've already explained, but mm -hmm. uh, you come to that slide. Come to my slide. Um, as per the uh, International Federation of Gynecology and Obstetrician, it has been divided into structural cause and non-structural cause. Structural cause, which can be seen or by imaging, we can see it. And non-structural means the systemic, any systemic abnormality. <clears throat> the uh, palm stands for polyp, adenomyosis, neomyoma, and malignancy and hyperplasia. And coin stands for coagulopathy, uh, ovulatory dysfunction, endometrium dysfunction, iatrogenic, and not otherwise classified. Right. So this this has been the latest uh, that has been adopted, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, if we uh, uh, whenever we want to classify some findings, say you have a leomyoma or you have a, a adenomyosis, so how would you uh, write your findings? Document your findings. Ma'am, we write in the similar manner. We, we write okay. palm coin. Then uh, whichever whichever modality for of the uh, is present That's for okay. the patient. We write, we, we, we present it to the number one. One stands for present and zero stands for it's not present for that patient. So we can write right. accordingly. So we write the whole thing. P-A-L-M-C-O-E-I-N and whichever is present is a one and mm -hmm. rest is all zero. Right? So at a glance, we can make out that this abnormal uterine bleeding is due to this particular cause, right? So as we can see over here that um, you have this uh, causes of uh, AUB as classified structural and non-structural. Non In our, our particular case, uh, since it is a leomyoma, there is a subclassification. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me that? Yes, ma'am. AUBL uh, can be classified into uh, seven, seven mm -hmm. uh, according to FIGO. Uh, uh, category 1 includes a pedunculated intracavitary uh, fibroid. Category 1 in, uh, zero, 0. Category 1 includes... The classification the, of the submucous fibroid. Okay? Yes, ma'am. Submucosal yeah. fibroid. Say start submucous fibroid. Submucosal yeah. fibroids. Uh, Classified into zero, 1 and 3. Mm -hmm. 0 stands for the pedunculated intracavitary submucosal fibroid. Category mm -hmm. 1 stands for a uh, submucosal fibroid which in which mm -hmm. there is less than 50 percentage of the intramural component. And mm. category two of the submucosal gives more than 50 percentage of the intramural. And mm. category three gives a contact endometrium, but it's 100 percent intramural. In category four, it doesn't even touch the endometrium, it is 100 percent intramural. Mm. And uh, category five, it is sub serous with more than or equal to equal uh, more than or equal to 50 percent intramural. Category mm. six gives a sub serous less than 50 percentage of the intramural component. Category seven gives a sub serous pedunculated, and category eight gives other other fibroids like cervical or parasitic or any other fibroid. So why we are classifying submucous fibroid as zero, one, and two, and three? Uh, ma'am, ma uh, ma uh, modality of the treatment, ma'am. Uh, okay. The treatment modality changes from zero, one, two, and three. If it's a zero or one uh, percent. Then we can go for a hysteroscopic myomectomy. If it is more than three, it's difficult. The treatment modality changes from zero in submucosal fibroids of zero, one, two, and three. Exactly. It should so be because hysteroscopy has really come up in a big way. So we need to be, uh, we need to categorize this to consider whether we can take it out hysteroscopically or we have to go for other methods. And right? here comes the role of MRI imaging also. Okay. Yes. yes. Mapping. Uh, sorry to interrupt. One question from my side. Uh, what are the current terminologies being used nowadays for the, for the cases of AUB? The, uh, there were certain terms that we used previously, but nowadays we are no more using those terms. So regarding those previous terminologies, what are the new terms that we are using now? Okay. 
Uh, Ma'am, the new terminologies includes acute, uh, acute. So we are talking in uh, terms of menorrhagia, metorrhagia. Yeah, other, uh, uh, other terminologies are there. Okay. There is a slide of it. Okay. Hmm. Ma'am, uh, okay. Ma acute uh, abnormal uterine bleeding means there is excessive menstrual bleeding which requires immediate intervention. The uh, chronic uh, uh, abnormal uh, uterine bleeding means there is bleeding since last six months, but it does not require immediate intervention. Third is the uh, AUV heavy menstrual bleeding, which was previously called menorrhagia. There is excessive menstrual blood loss, uh, which interferes the woman's uh, uh, physical, social, mental quality of life, irrespective of the duration, regularity, or volume or frequency of the menstrual cycle. Hmm. And fourth is the inter, uh, AUV intermenstrual bleeding, which was previously called metrorrhagia, which is hmm. bleeding in between the normal cycle, the normal regular cycle. Okay. And a, a, you, the, the third one, uh, define it again. Heavy menstrual AUV HMB. Heavy menstrual bleeding is defined as excessive menstrual bleeding, which interferes with the woman's quality, uh, physical, social, emotional, and mental quality of life. Irrespective mm. of the frequency, duration, or volume of menstrual cycle. See, so in this you can see days, eight days, and ATML. Uh, menstruation more than eight. And days. then yes, quantity more and than eight. plus it is interfering women's social, emotional quality of life, irrespective, irrespective of duration, regularity, volume, or frequency of menstrual cycle. Yes. So, so we have incorporated this. Yeah, so you need to understand that now HMB refers even if a woman is having bleeding for two days, it's excessively heavy. It's, it is uh, really affecting her emotionally. You know, that is also we will qualify as HMB, which was not being done earlier. Earlier we had fixed dates, we had fixed quantity to classify it as heavy menstrual bleeding, right? So this is how the new definition has changed. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so uh, if you could, uh, so apart go back to the previous slide. Okay, okay, huh. this one. No, after this, yeah. So we were talking of documentation, right? So you explained mm -hmm. to us how we have documented this particular documentation. What what would you think is the diagnosis? There is a clinical uh, uh, clinical practice. There is a clinical question given case of polyp and leomyoma. So we'll write as palm coin uh, polyp one adenomyosis zero and leomyoma one. The rest of the other all things are uh, written as zero if they are absent. Yes. Right. Good. So so that is one point which is very clear to all of us now that the number of etiologies and pathologies that we get in that particular patient, we have to keep adding a one point, right? Yes, so, okay, let's go on. Uh, now, apart from uh, routine history taking, two very important questions you have to ask in the history. Mm -hmm. So what are these questions other than your menorrhagia and all that and all that, what all you have to ask? Apart from the uh, abnormal and bleeding, is it called coagulopathy? Coagulopathy and drug history, ma'am. Okay. Yes. For drug history. Why is it very important? Because there are certain drugs which cause a lot of bleeding. Yes. And uh, like antifibrinolytics and you know drugs. There are certain Ayurvedic and homeopathic drugs also, which disturb the menstruation. So you should be uh, very particular about the drug history and coagulopathy. So. Uh, what are what are the criteria for saying that uh, this patient has coagulopathy? Take my next question. What would be considered a positive screen for coagulopathy? Figo has given the positive screening for coagulopathy. There are three points. If any one of the present, if any, any one of the following is present, is considered as coagulopathy. And further, we need uh, for the uh, further coagulation profile testing. It includes one. Uh, there is heavy menstrual bleeding since menarche. Second, any one of the following, there is history of postpartum hemorrhage or surgery-related bleeding or bleeding associated with dental work. And third, at least two of the following, uh, with one at least one episode of bruising per uh, month, at least one episode of uh, epistaxis per month, 
respect to uh, gum bleeding or if there is any family history of bleeding disorder so one particular thing we should all ask the patients ki bhai tumko daant se khun jata hai ki nahi you know that is a very important history because mm-hmm. bleeding of gums you know is very suggestive secondly ki if you have had a dental extraction which is also very common to bahut aisa to nahi hua ki bahut zyada khun gaya aur bahut ilaaj karana pada you know that these are very significant questions which you must ask thus also you have to ask her ki jab aapka shuru hua tha periods when your menarche had come to us time kaisa bleeding tha theek hai so you have not taken this in your history i i can uh, i remember your first this slide so you have not asked them ki aapka menarche kaisa tha so you must ask them ki did you have a heavy menarche how long did it go on also it gives you an idea ki agar anovulatory tha ovulatory tha thoda sa uh, this history has to be taken because mm-hmm. that was not taken right mm-hmm. so uh, any other uh, thing in uh, coagulopathy you want to tell us ma'am if there is any positive screening for the coagulopathy we will uh, go for further testing apart from bleeding time clotting time prominent and partial prominent time Uh, that includes a uh, von Willebrand antigen assay, uh, risk-setting uh, cofactor testing, and uh, uh, fibrinogen eight and nine assay testing. Man. Right. So the commonest uh, uh, this thing is von Willebrand congenital that we get. So we must be uh, that should be at the back of our mind, right? Whenever we are taking a history for DOB. So what are the FIGO's recommendations for lab testing? Ma'am, the laboratory testing, the FIGO has uh, uh, the first test that we routinely do in our setup is a urine pregnancy test, irrespective of the uh, irrespective of the patient's history. We take a urine pregnancy uh, urine pregnancy test, especially in patients of uh, in reproductive age group. Then we go for a complete blood count with platelets, especially with the platelets. Then we go for uh, we we have to screen out for coagulopathy, so we go with bleeding time, clotting time, and if they are deranged, we Go further in the case of a uh, for one will be in fact another, and then we go for a thyroid routine thyroid testing because hypothyroidism is also a cause of AUB. So these are the basic testing that we do um, in the initial assessment. Right. So uh, your initial assessment of the patient in general would be this, and then you will go for the what would be your the imaging uh, modalities. What is recommended? Uh, Before this, one thing has been left. That is, there was a pictorial assessment, PBAC ah, score, scoring for yeah. uterine bleeding that we have left mm-hmm. before investigations. What is that? Ma'am, it is uh, uh the, there is an assessment chart which is made, uh, which is we ask the patient. There is a slide of it. Take out this slide to assess the amount of bleeding, ma'am. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Yeah. Explain. Yes. and the pbs is scoring is done depending upon the bleeding if she is mm. using sanitary pads one mm. point is given if it is slightly stained mm. five point if it is moderately stained i mean and the sanitary pads if fully soaked 20 mm. points are given mm. for the each day mm. similarly for the tampons if it is slightly stained one point moderately stained five points and if mm. it is completely soaked 10 points is given mm. if there is history of clots one point for each small clot Five points for large clot, and five points for each episode of flooding. Hmm. These are the per day uh, scoring we ask the patient to uh, write it down or uh, told us to keep a record. We we'll ask her to keep a record, okay? And for the one menstrual cycle, we uh, add the points. Hmm. If it hmm. is more than hundred, it is considered hmm. as heavy menstrual bleeding. Yeah. Hmm. So if it, there's a fist full of clot that the patient is casting, how much would it be? How much ml? Ma'am, five hundred ml. A fist full of clot is equal to five hundred ml. Five hundred ml of clot. Okay, that is very important when we are going for deliveries and all, right? So this is for menstruation, yes. But for a delivery, if we lose a, a fist full of clot, that means we have nearly lost five hundred ml of blood. Just an incidental observation. So right. So we we have partly discussed the imaging modalities. Let us see what Figo has recommended. You just let us know. Take out this slide. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, this is level one recommendation. Start. 
Ma'am, uh, the recommendations of imaging ultrasonography is mandatory. Uh, is the is the first line of modality in AUB, ma'am. Uh, and next comes the Doppler sonography. Uh, and uh, we have to uh, we have to differentiate whether there it is an ultrasonography, uh, TVS, and transabdominal both. Both yes. can be done. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. What, what, what is the advantage? Is what is the advantage better? of doing transabdominal? Mm. Why do we want? To, so we are doing TVS, so I, you would say why do we want to do it? So why do we want to do a transabdominal? Ma'am, if it is a large mass, like if it is about the, uh, if it is large mass, TAS is the best modality because we can see the whole lot of what uh, what are the structures related. It's more visible, and a uh, TAS if there is like not only the uterus and the bilateral annexa, we can also see whether there is any um, like uh, if there is any um, hydronephrosis or anything related to pressure uh, because since the patient was having, my patients might uh, complain of. Pressure symptoms also. So to rule out that also, a TAS is done. TAS is done. Ma'am, why do you want to do Doppler? Ma'am, uh, the Doppler, ma'am, uh, fibroid and adenomyosis, we can differentiate. Basically. Basically, basically fibroid and adenomyomas could differentiate. In our how productive. You, and how will you differentiate with the Doppler? What would be the difference in a uh, fibroid and adenomyosis? Blood flow, batao. Endometrium. And there is irregular thickening with uh, fanning of... When they... Uh, one minute. One minute. How do the fibroid get its blood? To the capsule? Blood supply? That depends... Feeding vessels, man. What? What? See, in a Doppler, if you look at a fibroid, right? Fibroid supplies from pseudo capsule. Pseudocapsule. Pseudocapsule. Pseudo capsule. Uh, capsule. Yes. Uh, yes, in an around the boundary, the central portion will not be uh, very vascular. Whereas if you see an yes. adenomyosis, no such differentiation will be hmm. seen. Understand? So that, that is the main difference during Doppler ultrasonography. Okay, before before going to further, just tell me what do you mean by grade A level one? Yes. What? Ma why we talk of level one? What is what is that? Fine levels. Some imaging re uh, recommendations has been given. The okay. grade B level C one is. Um, level one is uh, the meta analysis of the randomized control trials and controlled randomized. Yes. Controls. Right. That is the best. Yes, it's the best yes. one. Yes. Best scientific support is level one. Level yes. two is yes. Level two is ma'am uh, meta analysis of the non-randomized prospective or case controlled trials, mm. non-randomized mm. prospective cohort and respective case control studies. Mm. It also be used, ma'am. Mm. Level three. Level three is cross-sectional studies, uh, uh, surveillance studies. Single case uh, reports, registers, yes, retrospective, uh, retrospective studies, mm -hmm. and level four is opine or consist by the experts of the clinical study. Yeah. Ah. So and maybe you have and if strength, you of have the strength, strength of recommendation. Strength of recommendation is strongly recommended. Mm -hmm. Okay. Is it? Come back to your slide. So okay, if you have a recommendation, like say it's a, uh, it's an A and it's level. Four, so what would be, would you go ahead or would you not go ahead with the procedure or whatever you plan? Yes, ma'am, we'll proceed. Right, because yes, level A is strongly recommended, although we do not have randomized trials, but we have clinical experience to say that we can do it, right? Mm -hmm. So it's yes. not exactly contraindicated. Okay. So, uh, mm -hmm. right till where were we? We had gone on to the investigation for that. Doppler, so, uh, Doppler ultrasonography, and after that, the 3D ultrasound read it. When 3D ultrasound, we mainly do with the patients who we are planning for a myomectomy. So, we have to plan a myomectomy or any submucosal fibroids are there. We have to exactly uh, locate the fibroids. Fibroid mapping is required for 3D ultrasound. Can your 3D ultrasound replace your MRI? Mm-hmm. <laughs> 
We have a marathon in our hospital. No, so. Because the ultrasound is good, but uh, it cannot replace the MRI because we, of course, want to distinguish between adenomyosis also and the smaller ones are left out and any other pathology also. Uh, any other problem that the fibroid is creating can be seen. But 3D ultrasound gives us, that is what I was telling you, most of the cases, 3D ultrasound, till 3D ultrasound is good enough. We don't need to do anything else for, for us to uh, decide our modality of treatment. Right? Sis, what about sis? Sis, nowadays we are not doing sis as such in our routine practice because we have other modalities. Only, uh, only if, if there is any intent in the endometrium, then only mainly it is in the case of submucosal fibroids. Okay. If there is any de displacing the ET, the uh, we are doing cysts nowadays. So what what do you have you seen a cyst? What yes, what exactly happened in a cyst? What, what do we see in a cyst? Ma'am, a uh, cyst is a procedure which is done on the OPD on the OPD basis. We inject a normal saline with the help of a cannula into the cervix. So with the help of the, we take, we uh, 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 place the prop in the abdomen and we see the endometrial lining. The normal saline that we are pushing will line the endometrium. So by lining the endometrium, if there is any fibroid, mm -hmm. there will be indentation of the endometrium. So that intent of the endometrium can be, uh, uh, can be seen. Which what, cannula? What else, what, else, what else? One very important point of cyst, which we were usually not using it for fibroid, but for something else. What was that? Excuse me. Uh, we were using cysts, not exactly to map fibroids or see fibroids. We were uh, using it for something else. Infertility of the tube can also yes. be tested. Yes, exactly. So that was at that time when we couldn't do HSG or we couldn't do uh, these things. So we used to do cysts. And uh, how does uh, it tell us the patency? Ma'am, uh, uh, by putting a color Doppler, ma'am. Color, okay. Color Doppler. No, 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 no. And one thing more. Simple cysts are doing on an ultrasonography. And uh, I, I say that the tubes are patent. What is that sign? What, what, what do we get? Fluid in POD, ma'am. Pardon? Fluid in POD. SIS is saline infusion sonography. Something else. You can see the fluid coming out of the uh, tubes. You know, it's like a uh, shower. You can see that coming. So that is how you see that it is patent. Fluid and POD is, uh, comes later. So when you are injecting, so you can see the cavity, then you can see the tube, and then you can see it falling like a waterfall. So that is how earlier we used to do a lot of cysts. I, uh, Dr. Pratiksha, what do you say? Uh, we are, we are, still we are doing cysts. You are still doing. We are not doing too much of cysts, but we earlier we used to do a lot of cysts. So cyst is what, uh, as, yeah, Dr. Sunita has well pointed it out, saline infusion sonography. For all our listeners, it is saline infusion sonography. So these days, children are very prone to, to shortcuts. So, <laughs> uh, right. so, okay. Now, what about hysteroscopy? What is your view uh, that we do hysteroscopy for diagnosis? Ma'am, hysteroscopy, uh, when it is, again, in the case of a submucosal fibroid, it is more, uh, it is a gold standard for if there is a submucosal fibroid, gold standard for, uh, investigation. Uh, not only in the case of submucosal, ma'am, uh, it's a operation also. While doing an hysteroscopy, yeah, if we see a submucosal fibroid, with the help of resectoscope, we can even resect the fibroid in the same setting. So it is it is more uh, easy for the patient also and for... And, but, uh, and, but why, why, why do you say that it is a gold standard only for fibroid? I would say it's a gold standard for entire the age. endometrial biopsy also it's a gold standard, ma'am. By seeing the endometrium, we can take if there are any endometrial abnormalities with the hysteroscope. We can so directly exactly. take them. You know, uh, the thing is that hysteroscopy these days has nearly the case. There are many clinicians and practitioners who uh, prefer hysteroscopy as a first line or first modality for diagnosing their uh, AUV. So in, what is the advantage of hysteroscopy? What are the advantages of hysteroscopy? Ma'am, the first thing that uh, it is uh, in the it's in the similar setting on uh, similar setting, so we can do uh, it's diagnosis. an operation also. It's a diagnostic okay. plus operational hysteroscopy can be done. And the second, 
Second, see, once again, I, I'll point the, uh, point out to you that, uh, uh, you know, when we're doing a diagnostic and <clears> in the same sitting to do an operative is uh, uh, slightly unplanned, you know. So normally if we have, uh, it's a very simple polyp or a very simple this thing we can think. But if you think that by doing a diagnostic and we have a, a subucous fibroid, which is indenting more than three centimeters, four centimeters. We cannot plan surgery. It has to be planned. It cannot be done in the same sitting, right? Mm -hmm. Same sitting only if it's a very small polyp or something which we can just take out. Mm -hmm. But if you think that we can suddenly do a TCRE without planning a patient, uh, so that, that would be difficult. Mm -hmm. So that that is not the prime uh, uh, advantage. What other advantages of hysteroscopy? Mm -hmm. Ma'am. Uh... We can actually see the endometrium if there are any abnormalities or, or if there, if there are any abnormalities. So if there is any endometrium, we can take a targeted biopsy with the help of a uh, with the help of a hysteroscope. Now, this is the one advantage. So and if you see, look, if you go by the definition of palm coin, right? So yes. you would diagnose a polyp, right? Yes. You would diagnose uh, probably not an adenomyosis, but yes, you could uh, sort of. Uh, see that the cavity is normal and if she's having fibroid-like symptoms then it's an adenomyosis. Then if you go for leomyoma definitely anything can be seen. Then uh, uh, if it's a malignancy definitely we will be able to see. So the structural, uh, all the structural uh, problems can be diagnosed with hysteroscopy. That is why if a clinician is good at hysteroscopy, she plans this as her first modality of diagnosis. Even in the other cases, uh, if it is, um, say, hyperplasia, if it is a tuberculosis, mm -hmm. even tuberculosis has a very typical feature in hysteroscopy. So you can diagnose. And infertility, you all know, that is uh, practically uh, uh, one of the most important modality of seeing the cavity. So these are the advantages. But what are the disadvantages of hysteroscopy? We have seen this. Ma'am, it's not an operative procedure if it is a big fibroid. Or something. It's not an operative no, procedure. What, what are the disadvantages of hysteroscopy? Can you go on to. Is um, I think that there is a slide on that I have made. Hmm. Nama ma'am already told now it's a skill it, it requires skill so it can't be done yeah, very there are a risk of perforation ma'am yeah. go, go to that slide go, go to my slide check out this slide yeah so what you need to understand is that the most important it part is that it is technically difficult and it has a high skill uh, curve of learning so that mm -hmm. is the biggest disadvantage then what all um, uh, there are chances of perforation and infection technically difficult for newer that's called this mm -hmm. so it's quite and the risk of perforation infection okay mm -hmm. so, so is the is the, is there a great risk in perforation of perforation in hysteroscopy? What we like we are doing a blind we are doing a blind dilatation, so we have a very great chance of perforating. It's under what vision, are we doing in hysteroscopy? Have you seen a hysteroscopy? Yes, ma'am. It's vision. under vision. So we are doing it. So we are doing it under less. vision. We are first visualizing the os, we are first visualizing the external os, then the internal loss, and then we are going into the cavity. So mm -hmm. chances of perforation are very less. If you are good at it and you are not using the hysteroscope as a dilator, you will not perforate. Do so remember that. So the, the primary thing is don't use hysteroscope as a dilator. If you use it as a dilator, you will do a perf. Then Another thing, what about, there? Are, there is a lot of apprehension that if we do hysteroscopy in a case of malignancy, we will, uh, uh, you know, disseminate the entire malignancy in the peritoneal cavity. How far is that true? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Rectomized control trials are not there, so it's not safe to be. Come on, mm -hmm. I'm not 
शॉर्ट डिप मैम की पिक्चर मैम so see uh, there is an apprehension that we disseminate the cancer cells to the uh, peritoneal cavity or oh, it's just theoretical as of date it has not been proven another thing is that when you are maintaining the hysteroscopic pressure we have to maintain it below 80 mm hg because in that pressure after that it opens opens up the uh, this thing into the peritoneal cavity so the idea of doing hysteroscopy is not to go beyond 80 so again the risks are much less if you maintain the pressure below the uh, defined limit of 80 mm hg you will not open up the tube so if you don't open up the tubes then obviously you're not going to go for a peritoneal spillage there is a theoretical risk but that does not prevent gynecologists from doing and do hysteroscopy for endometrial carcinoma because the biggest advantage is that your uh, blind uh, curettage you tend to miss that area 100 chances mm -hmm. endometrial aspiration again by endometrial aspiration you may have missed that area but if you do a hysteroscopic directed biopsy you will never miss it so that is the advantage and that is a very big advantage for that matter right Yes, so uh, any 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 questions dr pratiksha on this no it's all, it's okay now can we now come to the new tre uh, the treatment modalities in the various avus yeah okay take out this slide so this is very uh, uh, a vast topic so let us take it one by one you start with a polyp then you go to uh, adenomyosis because uh, how you going to treat each of these is uh, an important thing to know so if it is a polyp what would be your uh, approach well it if it is a submucosal pol polyp we can go for is just uh, we can go for so no, one would be a polyp which is lying at the cervix what would you do you can see two thirds of it what would you do you can go for cervical polypectomy how And, there are two ways of doing cervical polypectomy how would you do it if if you can see the stalk and if you cannot see the stalk Ma'am, if we can see the stalk, we can uh, clamp the stalk and with the help of what? What? With the help of a clamp, we can uh, we can clamp the uh, uh, the stalk and, and with the help of what we can remove the polyp. You don't have to do anything. You just hold it and just twist it. You take come. But if you don't see the stalk, then there is a problem, right? Then we have to kind of dissect it out from the capsule and then first clamp. Uh, dissect it out from the capsule and then take it out. So this, these are the two differences that you have. But uh, then, if it is inside the cavity, obviously you go for a hysteroscopic removal. What else can you do? No, ma'am. Would you be doing? Would you be doing ablation or maybe PCRD in case of? Take out these slides. There are slides of it. Put these slides. and uh, there are uh, different methods of uh, new modalities first is the endometrial ablation the first generation second generation uh, ablation uh, the first generation we we used to do uh, trans cervical resection of the endometrium also the roller ball so but would you be doing this for a fibroid i'm not convinced mm -hmm. yeah. would you be doing trans cervical resection or maybe a roller ball have you seen a pcr Being done or a roller ball PCR being done? We do it, but not no. in fibroid. Yeah, not in fibroid. Ah, not in fibroid because you know what the PCR does is that it will remove the endometrial lining, right, mm -hmm. up to a depth of say five millimeters. Mm -hmm. So if it if it's a big fibroid, we don't go into that. So it's not possible. So basically, the all these treatment that you have shown me, can you go back? uh all these that you are showing is basically for your endometrial hyperplasia mm -hmm. but these days uh, do you do all this for endometrial hyperplasia is it in any way a treatment modality now what is our best option why should we do endometrial ablation when we have very uh, good options with us mm -hmm. is anyone doing it may i ask the uh, um, attendees 
participants is is uh, tcre rollerball being done so okay we have no reply anyway so uh, this is more important for endometrial hyperplasia not for a fibroid fibroid as you correctly said we would go for hysteroscopic removal in that we have that loop right which which can be taken around the polyp and we can resect it so basically it's a loop removal uh, this thing or we can shave off you know in tcre if we have a small fibroid we can shave off the fibroid as far as practicable uh, reaching at the interface of the myometrium and um, endometrium but for big ones we cannot do it so to some extent we can use this uh, roller ball would not be very effective but tcre we can to some extent use it for a sub uh, submucous polyp we can just shave off as much as we can see then we go for a second sitting later on when the remaining part could roots out then we do the removal after that right so uh, that's it uh, regarding by uh, this radio frequency and microwave ablation i, I these are more theoretical i myself personally i don't know see that. i don't know if you all know that इंडिकेशन is it suggested that we do uterine artery embolization what are the contraindication of uterine artery embolization how it is done okay ma'am mm -hmm. uh, uterine artery embolization is uh, is indicated when the patient is symptomatic there is a symptomatic fibroid and the patient doesn't need to uh, preserve there is a no desire for uh, pres fertility preserving and uh, preserving and there are any arterial venous malformations and if the patient is not fit for surgery like in a uh, perimenopausal woman when we do a uva and after few years she can go she can go back to her, into her menopause so in a perimenopausal woman we can do a uva and uh, when patient patient is not fit for surgery but she needs immediate treat, uh, immediate treatment so in that case is also we can use uva ma'am it is not embolization is a new modality uh, so how does the uh, embolization act what does it do Ma'am, there are microspheres of a polyvinyl alcohol or a uh, uh, polyvinyl alcohol. They act as a uh, uh, they induce uh, occlude the uh, vessels, ma'am. They they induce thrombosis. They're directly injected into the arteries. Okay. So thereby causing a necrosis of the fibroid. Right. This is and what, uh, after embolization, any side effects? Ma'am, post embolization syndrome is there, which causes pain, pain which is normally treated. with nsaids and analgesics uh, analgesics and there can be a growing um, hematoma mm -hmm. since we are doing and there can be chances of sepsis sepsis also can be patient sepsis and pain basically sep pain, pain and sepsis can we can we lose a patient in embolization ma'am it's a guided procedure it's uh, the same i think the risk is similar it's no, not simple complication it's a, a 24 hour procedure ma'am one day procedure if it doesn't need any ah procedure. it is but uh, we do lose patients in embolization not often but rarely we do so uh, you can em rt embolization is being not being done routinely which is the centers which are doing it in delhi just for the knowledge of people around i think it's aims and uh, mamsi i'm not sure about mamsi but gangaram private in private gangaram is doing ah, gangaram mm -hmm. Hmm. So okay. So then, then uh, uh, what are we left with? What, what, till where have M we reached? Ah, right. M Haifu. So what? Is, what what is about Haifu? Haifu? Is it much in these days. Yeah. Ma'am, so, it is a procedure. Uh, it's, uh, we are not doing. It's a procedure in which, uh, with M with the help of M uh, M M uh, M R guidance, we will focus ultrasound waves on a particular fibroid, ma'am. so in that particular fibroid there is the actually the use of um, sound energy into mechanical energy then to heat energy so there are reduction of fibroids 
so this is a relatively costly a procedure where we do mr high inclusion criteria they they set inclusion criteria only those patients can be can we think uh, we are thinking of high food and only fibroids yes if there are any subserosal fibroids we cannot do because subserosal fibroids they can obliterate with the bowel so they can uh, the cause bowel, bowel injury cause okay. bowel injury. they can cause bowel injury and if there are multiple fibroids also this hmm. is not recommended and hmm. this, uh, wants to preserve the youth preserve her fertility also this is not recommended hmm. Hmm. Um, and is it, is it very common is it a common procedure no ma'am no, it's ma very expensive procedure it's done wait is done do you know ma'am miss uh, central delhi ma'am apollo hospital apollo medanta aims they were doing it medanta also so you have you have any study showing how successful they are in fibroids you know in pain menopausal women they show a uh, symptomatic improvement was there and then uh, and post menopausally there was reduction but uh, <clears throat> um as such it's not very uh, not very popular mm -hmm. it's not popular and the recommendation is fibroid should be not more than how many centimeters 12 cm 12 cm uh 12 cm size of the uterus and fibroid should be around 4 to 6 cm it's 5 cm not 12 cm okay so uh, okay we can open it to the house to ask questions we have completed our discussion on aub and uh, anyone wants to ask any questions can put the question on the chat we have 10 minutes with us um yeah the before they put some questions on the chat box uh, let me invite dr deepthi to give her comments deepthi please yes ma'am sorry i got disconnected for a moment uh, this was just tell me where we were discussing our embolization yeah after embolization they have come to mr guided focused ultrasound hi pro deepthi yes. dr deepthi hi Ah, let me start my video. At least we can see each other. Ah, yeah, na. School of hai, dekhe. Ah, Dr. Sunita Malik is our teacher. Yes, no. yes, it's a small world. We all come together. <laughs> Shivani is my classmate also, you know. <laughs> so sorry for the little distractors, but this is heart to heart between two people who connected long way back. So we were just. I think it is going very well, Pratiksha. You have been doing an excellent job, and I must get you for my more AUB classes now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It was. I was enjoying the whole discussion throughout. So MR guided focus ultrasound. This is the latest inventory in our repertoire, which we can be using for doing the fibroids. But if you ask me the personal experience, I don't have it. We don't have it at our place. so if if there is somebody in the audience who has it they can speak about it and i don't think anybody has seen also it yes. has two major complication one is deep vein thrombosis and bowel injury bowel burning mm -hmm. so and it is very matlab apollo okay. hospital they were doing it initially they experienced the same i met one of the doctors she told me that mm -hmm. and it is it's uh, also it is it's fallen out to yeah it's the, not being used these days Hmm. Um, anything else uh, dr deepthi you would like to add I on think i just wanted to uh, make them understand that at times there can be aub and there can be a small fibroid but that suppose there is a small fibroid of say about 2 cm intramyometrial or sub serous let us say and patient has aub so would you like to label it as aubl yes bachcho shipra Yes, ma'am. Will yes, patient has a two centimeter fibroid. Patient is a forty year old lady. She has a two centimeter subserous fibroid, and she presents to you with AUB with AUB, and your sonologist writes down AUBL. Would you agree with this diagnosis? Yes, ma'am. AUB is due to fibroid or not? AUB. It's not due to fibroid, but yes, yeah, this no, is a point uh, of diagnosis. Two centimeter fibroid is not responsible for abnormal yes. for such. Can I yes? Can I make a point? See, yeah. uh, what you are asking basically is that if we go into the palm point definition, uh, mm -hmm. you are saying fibroid. Okay, I write uh, L one, but 
definitely we will get something else over here. You know, mm -hmm. some coin part we will get, an ovulation, ovulation, some other factor will come in. It cannot be a two centimeter fibroid which is causing the AUV. So uh, it's not a question of labeling, but it's a question of finding out what else is there apart from that. You ask fibroid. yourself, please ask the question which I ask all of my PGs to ask. Ask yourself, what am I dealing with? Am I dealing with this fibroid or is AUB the, uh, the manifestation of this fibroid or something else? If you apply your brain, I mean, if you think about it, you will realize this two centimeter fibroid is not likely to be the cause of AUB and you will look for something else. Yeah, exactly. Whatever exactly. It and another question which I can see Dr. Rajukra has put in is about the management of acute AUB. Hmm. So that that is something which which happens, I mean, books say something, all of us manage it differently, and we all have our own recipes to manage these acute AUVs. Uh, so let us hear from uh, what our students will manage. Now you see, so you, I will give you two scenarios. One girl has come, she's 16 years of, she's 14 years of age. She has attained menarche, say three months back, and now she has come extanguinated at about five gram per cent, and uh, she's bleeding, passing clots. One mm. is this scenario, so how will you manage it? This can be asked as a puberty menorrhagia, but mm -hmm. we don't keep it. So let us keep it as AUBO. As you can imagine that this is a young girl who has just attained menarche. So how will you manage this girl? Ma'am, um, comes the medical management, Shipra. Yes, ma'am. Ma'am, first we'll rule out the pregnancy. Mm -hmm. Then uh, thereafter we'll, uh, we'll optimize her hemoglobin. Uh, if she's a 5 gram percent, uh, we'll transfer one uh, 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 PRBC accordingly and we'll uh, rule out the other cause of bleeding like uh, if there is any as she is uh, menarche she attained menarche just three months back we'll rule out any coagulopathy or uh, any uh, what specific coagulopathy are you looking for mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. what mm -hmm. specific mm -hmm. one mm -hmm. disease so mostly the platelet disorders there you are going to look for Right, mm -hmm. because if it is actually a clotting disorder like hemophilia or something, she may give past history. Usually, in certain platelet disorders, mm -hmm. she may not have had past history of any sp any spontaneous that history. Here, the history of gum bleed and all do become important in such patients. Chalo, you have done tested and there is nothing. She doesn't have coagulopathy. Not an example. Uh, uh, Ma'am, uh, we'll then give antifibrinolytic agent like tranexamic acid uh, to stop the bleeding. And for pain, uh, we'll, uh, we'll what give... Goes, what route, what frequency? And we'll give IV uh, intravenous therapy, one gram thrice a day of uh, four, uh, four times a day till bleeding stops. And what then how, how, how good is it? How much response you expect in a patient who is flooding, passing clots? Ma'am, it will reduce the bleeding by 50%. What is your experience here? Whatever the books might say, you must have tackled many of such girls. Um, uh, Do they stop bleeding with the Trenexa alone? No, they really stop bleeding with Trenexa or not? No, ma'am. Not alone, ma'am. Yes, so what is else would you add? Thing. What else would you add? Um, oral contraceptive pills. Do you think oral contraceptive pills is a good idea for a girl, say, a 14 year of age? We may use short term, you can use anything. Mm -hmm. Here, even the consultants will differ in their opinion. I'm sure me, Pratiksha, and Dr. Uh, Sinha is there. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So here. we all may differ in our opinion. We all have learned how to tackle this and we use this. What is the uh, thing if they want, if, you, if it's a 14 year old boy, old girl, what is something which affect, which people have a little reservation about in using OC pills? For long term, particularly if you are using for months together. Uh, mm -hmm. See, this is acute, so we don't need to bother about long term. We have to basically go for hormones over here if we are not able to control with Trenexa. So, what are the hormones we would go for, Shama? What options? Let us say what options you have. One you say is OC pill. Again, tell me the dose, duration, and how will you give? And which, mm -hmm. which OC pill would you give? Suppose you are supposed called upon to write a prescription. You can't write OC pill, no? you have to write something. Ethinyl is extradiol containing a uh, monophasic combination of ethinyl. Uh, so, you can't write it, you can't write it. You can't write it. What do you do practically in the board? Tell that. 
Ma'am, OCPIL pills uh, combined malain we can give to that patient. Yes, you malain. How much estrogen does it contain? Um, Thirty-five microgram. Okay, so how will you tell her to take tell this girl to take this tablet? Ma'am, we can start on uh, day two to then twenty-one days of twenty-one days oh, we can. Day two, this day girl is not bleeding, na? Ma'am, so on that day only she can start, and then we can take it continuously for twenty-one days, ma'am. तुमने कभी किसी चौदह साल की लड़की को वन टी डी एस ओसी पिल देख के ब्लीडिंग कंट्रोल करी है सो इन एग्जाम जस्ट This is the area where one can make out whether you are reading and say theoretically or you have actually tackled such patient. First, tell me, have you tackled seen such fourteen-year-old girl, girl with heavy bleeding? Yes, ma'am. So what, what was that? What what, what, what can, can you recall treatment? about her treatment? Jo karao. The commonest commonest that we used to give. Remember, we give progesterone. No, in general, yes, commonest. See, देखो एक common sensical बात है बेटा. इसमें ओविलेटरी एयूबी हो क्यों रहा है बिकॉज वो ओविलेट नहीं कर रही ओविलेट नहीं कर रही तो इट इज नो नो कॉर्पस यूटियम नो प्रोजेस्ट्रॉन ठीक है और वो शेड कर करके कर करके उसकी ये जो है ये किस तरह की ब्लीडिंग बोलोगे दिस इज शेडिंग 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 बिकॉज इट डजेंट है प्रोजेस्ट्रॉन ईस्ट्रोजन बनता जा रहा है उससे वो एक लिमिट तक ग्रो करता है और जब वो सेल्फ सस्टेनिंग नहीं होता वो शेड होके ब्लीडिंग हो जाता है फिर आप अल्ट्रासाउंड करोगे तो ईटी इसकी बहुत कम रहेगी सो अगर एंडोक्रिनोलॉजिकल पॉइंट ऑफ से बुझो द बेस्ट थिंग इज टू रिप्लेस व्हाट शी इज मिसिंग शी इज मिसिंग प्रोजेस्टोन यू गिव हैविंग सेड दैट गिविंग ईस्ट्रोजन प्रोजेस्टोन कंबाइंड इज आल्सो नॉट इलॉजिकल इट कैन बी गिवन इट हैज ईस्ट्रोजन एज वेल एज प्रोजेस्टोन कई बार इतना एंडोमेट्रियम वी डोंट नो एग्जैक्टली हाउ थिक द लाइनिंग इज कई बार इतनी ज्यादा शेडिंग हो चुकी होती है ये गिविंग अ लिटिल ईस्ट्रोजन एंड प्रोस्टोन स्टेबलाइजेस द एंडोमेट्रियम फास्टर बेसिकली इफ यू डू अल्ट्रासाउंड प्रायर तो आपको ये एंडोमेट्रियम थिकनेस की हो जाए तुरंत अल्ट्रासाउंड कर लो एंडोमेट्रियम थिकनेस देख लो वी कांट डू एंडोमेट्रियल एंड अल्ट्रासाउंड प्रायर आल्सो नहीं है रात को आइए 10 बजे हां नहीं है तो नहीं भी कर सकते फाइन बोथ द ऑप्शंस आर वाइज आई वांट टू पे नीड टू रिमेंबर दैट द पेशेंट इज इन अक्यूट एयूबी राइट सो अक्यूट एयूबी वी हैव टू हैंडल अकॉर्डिंगली इंजेक्टेबल फेनेक्सा मे बी इंजेक्टेबल प्रोजेस्टेरॉन्स ओरल प्रोजेस्टेरॉन्स एडेड टू इट फेनेक्सा प्रैक्टिकली आई हैव सीन एनी पेशेंट डॉक्टर किशोर राजूकर हैज पुट इन जस्ट अ क्वेश्चन अबाउट आईवी एक्सपाइनर फ्रैंकली स्पीकिंग आई विल से इन माय 25 30 year of practice i have never given it to anybody and i have never failed to manage a patient of menorrhagia like this with progesterone this is my personal experience in very young girl abhi to aapne ye episode control kar diya chalo short term dekhe ye dobara bleed kar sakti hai fir kya dobara usi pills pe dalenge kitne din tak dalenge kyunki jo bahut choti ladkiyan hai 14 saal ki unme epiphyseal closure estrogen se hota hai they may still have some time to grow their bones इसको लेके एक थेरेटिकल रिजर्वेशन रहता है टू स्टार्ट लॉन्ग टर्म ओसीपिल्स फॉर वेरी यंग गर्ल्स से ऑफ 13 14 इयर्स ओल्ड प्रेजेंटिंग विद प्यूबर्टी नरेरिया आई एम सेइंग थेरेटिकल बिकॉज़ दैट इज अ मैटर ऑफ देयर बोन्स आर स्टिल क्लोजिंग दे मे नॉट हैव एपिफिसिस मे नॉट हैव क्लोज इसको लेके रहता है सो इन माय बोथ ऑप्शंस कैन बी गिवन यू कैन गिव शॉर्ट टर्म इन शॉर्ट टर्म यू कैन गिव ओसीपिल्स एंड यूजुअली इन माय प्रैक्टिस आई सी इवन वन टैबलेट सफाइसेस यू गिव वन टैबलेट एंड at the most two tablets and definitely not tedious please don't give tedious your patient will be very very uneasy with taking three tablets she will have lot of nausea vomiting so uh, what i experience pratiksha what i'm sharing is one tablet of ocipils once a day usually does dena hai at the most twice a day de do do din ki do din ke baad fir once a day kar dijiye among the progesterone i want you to tell me what progesterone you will give what dose what frequency how long ये तो तुम्हें पता है बताओ बताओ मिड्रोक्सी प्रोजेस्ट्रॉन एसिटेट बी गिवन 10 mg फर्स्ट फॉर द फर्स्ट फ्यू डेज एज शी इज एक्यूट एक्यूट हैवी मेंस्ट्रुअल ब्लीडिंग देन 20 mg स्टार्टिंग फ्रॉम द 20 mg फोर टाइम्स अ डे और थ्री टाइम्स अ डे एंड व्हेन द ब्लीडिंग आई कुड आई डोंट गेट इट यू टेल मी व्हाट डोज विल यू स्टार्ट विद व्हाट इज 
Midroxyprostone acetate. How much? Sorry, please repeat. I couldn't. Uh, 20 mg thrice a day. 20 mg thrice a day. That is, that 60, is 60 mg per day. Oh. Okay. So this girl is 14 year old. Okay. BMI of 18. You are giving 60 mg per day. All right. Then. 10 then. 10 mg twice a day. the first two, three days. That works. Then we can reduce it. will taper the dose, ma'am. What have you given in your clinical experience? What did you give into your patients, girls? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, 10 mg. We, we have given 10 mg twice a day, ma'am. What? Bidroxyprotestone? Bidroxyprotestone. Does, it, is, does it stop bleeding completely? Completely, ma'am, but it decreases the menorrhagia. She is puberty menorrhagia. Puberty menorrhagia, she's bleeding. She's passing clots, which is just say, 5 gram HB. She's, she's flooding, she's passing clots. A 10 mg BD is a good thing. How much is drawn? Any other option? Speak in the board. Tell me what you have done. You have to do your clinic. You have to do your clinic. You have to do 10 mg midroxyprestron twice a day. This is what you are telling me? This is too low. 20 mg per day. Okay. You have to do 10 mg BD will do nothing to her. As far as. Nay, and you are using medroxyprogesterone or any yes. other progesterone? Yes, this was the next question, Dr. Shivani. I was going Mama, to ask. Yes. Primalute. No, please tell me the generic name. I don't want any trait. Puberty menorrhagia is a reproductive age group. It is a salt. Or a acetate. Or a norethisterone acetate. Kitna? 10 mg. 10 mg BD, ma'am. BD will not do. BD will not work. First two, three days, you have to go on a high dose, then taper it down. So this is for progesterone. You can even, uh, without going for a tedious dose, it's not the non. We are talking of acute AU. Compare the two preparations that you just named. Two progesterone preparations that you have Named, compare their mortality of action. What do you give in the ward? We give Primalutin in our wards. What is Primalutin? What do you give in the ward? I ask you how you have managed your patients. You are not coming out and again you are taking a trade name. I am asking you to take generic names. अच्छा तुमने कई किताबों में एक नॉर्थ एथिंड्रोन भी पढ़ा होगा ये एक ही चीज होती है अलग अलग होती है ये ये बायदा वे वाला क्वेश्चन है क्योंकि जब मैं पीजी थी मैं बड़ा कंफ्यूज होती थी ये किस किसी की बात में एथिंड्रोन है किसी में नॉर्थ एथिस्ट्रोन है ये क्या है अलग अलग कंपाउंड है Just to give you the answer. Which I discovered. Which I discovered. Norethindron and Northestron are the name of the same preparation. Ek Amrita wale use karte, ek England wale use karte. Yes, don't get confused. And the difference is, it has got some androgenic action, which is a better hemostat. So Norethindron acetate is a better hemostat in, I will share. So you have all options. You have option of ocipril. You have option of midroxyprostone acetate. You have option of norethistone acetate. I can tell you in my clinical practice, I traditionally use norethistone acetate, 10 mg TDS. I will give it for three days. Then I will taper to BD and total of 21 days and patient is all right. And after that, I again put on cyclical progesterone. This is what I'm doing in my clinical practice. If you use MPA, the dose needs to be higher, and at times it is not that effective a hemostat. But definitely you need to use dose higher than 10 mg BD. If you are using OC pills, Mala N is a perfectly cheap, easily available option available uh, for managing those cases. Once a day usually suffices. If not, you can use twice a day. This is how I have no experience in giving IV conjugate equine estrogen, and I have never failed in managing a case of puberty menorrhagia, which is the uh, which is not coagulation disorder related with my this recipe of treatment, if I may say so. So, Dr. Pratiksha, would you like to comment?
What is the role of uh, Mifepristone in a management of AUB? Ma'am, Mifepristone can be given as a... Uh, uh, as a Ma'am, no, it's a progesterone uh, 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 blocker. So you know, we have we had a slide. We had two slides of uh, all these drugs and uh, everything. Can they put it on? And a slide, Susme? Bhool gaye bache. Maybe so. No, ma'am, drugs. Acha, cut cut gaya. अभी जाओ आई थिंक है इन तीस नहीं नहीं इटियोलॉजी इटियो इटियोलॉजी पर क्या था कोई नहीं याद हो तो बता दो ऐसे व्हाट वाज द क्वेश्चन प्रतीक्षा आई वाज जस्ट आस्किंग यू टू कमेंट अपॉन व्हाट इज योर एक्सपीरियंस विद मैनेजिंग पुबर्टी मेनोरिजिया आई हैव शेयर्ड माय यू नो अगर वी हैव अल्ट्रासाउंड ऑन द क्लॉक वी आर डूइंग इन आ इन आ लेबर रूम्स फॉर द पेशेंट्स हु आर कमिंग इन इमरजेंसी आल्सो वी डू अ एंडोमीट्रियल थिकनेस वी कैन डू इफ एंडोमीट्रियल इज वेरी थिन इट्स एब्सेंट यू डोंट थिंक इट्स बेटर टू गिव इस्ट्रोजन फर्स्ट इस्ट्रोजनाइज्ड लॉजिकली यू आर सेइंग राइट बट नन ऑफ द बुक्स विल एडवाइज टू ट्राइज अ पेशेंट अबाउट ट्रीटमेंट यूजिंग अल्ट्रासाउंड This is the point. We may be doing it in our clinical practice mm. and in surgical sense. It just का इसको ये काम हो गया है. उसको आप उस दे दो. लेकिन मैंने हमेशा बिना ultrasound के puberty menorrhages manage करे होंगे. तो कितने यहाँ में available होता? And mm. all of nine. I can't recall a single patient who had not responded to norethistone acetate 10 mg tdc. Nee, they respond. They respond beautifully. And secondly, OCPs are very also very effective. Well, very like, effective. Either. Very either effective. Respond. On. I'm not so happy about my experience with methoxyprestone acetate has not been so good. Huh. In, in control. In puberty menorrhagia. And I will not rule that out. It can mm. be, and but dose has to be higher than 10 mg PD, mm. and it has to be given for when there is acute space. Give it continuously for 21 days. Mm. You can give it a higher dose for first three to four days and gradually taper it to a little medium dose. Like TDS may be 10 mg TDS of norethrosone may be a little higher. Then mm. I will go to a BD dose and keep it for twenty one days. After twenty mm. days, you withdraw all treatment for seven days. Let her have a withdrawal leave, and after that, you can again take a call whether you want to give it. Uh, rather, I would give it for at least three to four months, mm. just twenty uh, one days for just on. So say, uh, my routine is twenty one day on, seven day off, twenty one day on, seven day off, and that works beautifully. Mm. So okay, so the consensus exactly. is already said, uh, and uh, all some three, places. All three are all three can be given: progesterones or uh, OC pills, and two preparation of progesterones we have discussed for puberty menorrhagia, along with correction of anemia and ruling out any coagulation disorder. Okay. Any other question? Anyone? Anything else? Any other question? Doctor Taru, you would like to add anything? No, I think. Uh, All the investigations and management options they are discussed. They were discussed in detail by moderators. Moderators had very well examined the students, and we had very informative comments by Dr. Deepthi. So I congratulate all of you, and I hope this uh, case discussion will be very fruitful for all the attendees. If there are any questions from the other PG students, we would be happy to answer them. I think everyone is. Ma'am wants to say something. Yeah. Doctor Sunita Malik, she wants to say something. Yes, yeah. ma'am. Yeah, I wanted to say in history, it was very. I mean, it was very well presented case and uh, discussed also very well by the moderators and the PGs. One thing is that like she has menstrual problem and that menstrual problem was discussed in the present history. Then when we came to menstrual history, then again she started telling that uh, the, she has uh, having bleeding with the. Menstrual history is past. That's prior to the uh, whatever the present history was. Go back to that. Yes. See again. So you don't have to tell present cycle again in menstrual again, history, right. which mm -hmm. has been described already in your present history. So that's another thing. Then go back next. Come to the past history. 
yeah no history of any heavy menstrual bleeding or dysmenorrhea since menarche so again this should have come in menstrual history starting from menarche any any abnormality if it was this past histories for medical and surgical illness or related mm -hmm. to this thing so these mm -hmm. two small small points okay. should have been uh, taken care of and of course uh, there was one or two question any role of endometrial biopsy in a case of fibroid yes anybody wants to answer shivani just check the questions yes yes yeah please uh, answer i think this was one of them which was in the chat box to shama to please answer the mm -hmm. role of endometrial biopsy in aub ma'am uh, age women ma'am uh, the age group of uh, aub uh, endometrial biopsy in aub we keep it as a more than 40 years in more than 40 years of the pa patients who comes with aub a routine endometrial biopsy can be done but in patients who presented with a less than 40 years of age and presented with comp and they are having high risk factors for endometrial ca and if there are if they are having any failed medical management and there is any family history of like hnpcc or lynch syndrome then there they are indications of endometrial bi endometrial biopsy now so what do you understand by risk factors for uh, this endometrial cancers what do you what which patients would you like to offer endometrial sampling uh, what are those at risk patients ma'am uh, they are on continuous estrogen therapy patient conti continuous Uh, patients with continuous history the patients who are the known case of pcos or who are obese so these patients you would like to offer endometrial sampling in in less than 40 years of age also definitely above 40 you have to offer endometrial sampling to rule out any uh, pre malignant or a malignant condition okay as per nice it states 45 and as per rcog it is 40 so we take uh, as per indian guidelines we take 40 years as the cut off and this there's another question which medicine is good for medical management of fibroid so ma'am medical management of fibroid uh, the first line is always uh, nsaid which includes tranexamic acid and all no no that's for the bleeding i'm not asking you for that uh, somebody is asked for the fibroid management mam gnrh agonist causes shrinkage of volume of fibroid no gnrh agonist can be given uh, so what are the indications in which patients you would offer gnrh and logs mam gnrh agonist they can be uh, given which we uh, who needs to preserve the uh, in which uh, there is uh, aub is caused with fibroid and uh, In patients who are in surgery, has the perimenopause. Okay, hemoglobin is low, and we need to build the hemoglobin uh, to the patient. Symptomatically, we have to we have to uh, we need betterment of the patient in those patients. We can give a GNRH agonist. Hmm. There is another question that antagonist. Ma'am, antagonist. Since it is uh, there are uh, uh, there uh, in India, it's very expensive, so we not use GNRH antagonist as such. Uh, so. But it uh, it uh, but it uh, allows shrinkage of um, um, the fibroid. Of fibroid. Which is better, antagonist or agonist? In uh, if the patient is better for the patient's uh, thing, learn the antagonist. What is disadvantage of agonist? Ma'am, there are flare up, uh, flare up actually. Initial flare up of the symptoms are present in case of why? Why? Because there is a down condition. Can you tell me? Ma'am, GNRS is gone. एगोनिस्ट क्या करता है रिसेप्टर एक्टिवेशन रिसेप्टर एक्टिवेशन मैम इट एक्ट्स एज एन एगोनिस्ट सो इट फर्स्टली इट विल रिलीज द गोनाडोट्रोफिन्स एंड देयरबाय इट कॉजेस द इनिशियल ब्लीडिंग फेज फॉर द या फ्लेयर अप सो द एगोनिस्ट टेक्स अराउंड 2 टू 3 वीक्स वीक्स टू एक्ट बस व्हाट अबाउट एंटागोनिस्ट इट विल इमीडिएटली सप्रेस द 4 टू 6 आवर्स मैम 48 Four to eight hours, there is the effect of GnRH antagonist. Antagonist, antagonist, and it is better because there is no player with antagonist. Mm -hmm. But it is quite expensive. Mm -hmm. okay? okay. So there is another question: Is there yes. any medical management for adenomyosis? Also, we can give medical management. Um, Ellen. Yes, Shipra, Dipshika. Okay. Who was talking? Ellen, I U S B are using now, Shama. Yes, ma'am. LNG IUS is the main modality for adenomyosis, which contains fifty-two uh, mm -hmm. microgram. Yeah. 
It's not a FDA approved as such. Uh, it's not of, FDA approved in India. Okay, it is not FDA approved. India has toxicity. Very similar in cases of acetate. So very. There's um, a black box warning, you know, mm -hmm. which state is not used nowadays. Mm -hmm. Doctor Deepika, do you want to say something about Yuli Pristal? Deepika for Jackson Paul. Uh, Ma'am, actually, Yuli Pristal uh, now. Uh, in December uh, last year, status? yeah, in December 2021, uh, the DCGI has again allowed for uh, Ulipristal to be used because there were only four cases of this liver, uh, such high liver toxicity and uh, being fatal and all throughout the world and none of it in India. And then when the uh, DCGI actually worked on this and had a committee set up for reviewing this, uh, then what the ban was, that was lifted. And only thing is that now we have to be careful about the liver enzymes. Just before starting, we have to give uh, take the LFT report. And uh, in between also, we have to keep on monitoring LFTs. In case the LFT goes above two times, then you are supposed to stop it. Otherwise, uh, it is going to give very good results. Only thing is you have to be watchful of the LFTs. Those of you live still, Shipra? Um, it is 10 mg OD prescribed. 5 to 10 mg OD. Okay. 5 to 10 mg OD. The proper counsel is also very expensive. Mm -hmm. It is quite expensive. Quite expensive. Available uh, uh, trade name bhi kya hai? Gilata. Jackson Paul has it as Uliprist. Or bhi hai, ek or hai. Jackson Paul ka jo hai trade name is Uliprist. Y U L I P R I S T. Somebody is commented for apoptosis also in side effects, no? Somebody has commented. So all questions are over? Yes, I think all questions are covered now. So yeah, we'll come uh, to the last slide. So we can just watch <laughs> <laughs> so very well done, Hena. I congratulate both the students and I also congratulate the moderators who have been working with the students since last few days continuously. So thank you so much. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So on uh, behalf of AOGD and the Delhi PG Forum, I would uh, really like to say that it was a wonderful discussion. The chairpersons, uh, Dr. Taru, Dr. Deepti, they have uh, really spared their valuable time for us and the moderators and the presenters, Dr. Maruti, Dr. Pratiksha, and uh, the Dr. presenters, also. Dr. Ah, Dr. Deep Shikha, and uh, the presenters, Dr. Shama and Dr. Shipra. They have really done a wonderful job. And I would also like to thank our lovely audience, the various PGs from different colleges. They must have definitely benefited from today's class. And last but not the least, Jackson Pal, Dr. Deepika, for this excellent platform that she has given. And uh, I hope she keeps giving this platform to us. <laughs> and this was, and my and this was my last slide. Good luck to all the PG students. I'm sure you'll all do great. Our next class is on 19 December uh, on renal disease in pregnancy. That will be by Himsar students. So that is for information. So thank you all. And uh, thank you and bye everybody. Thank yeah, you. bye. Good. And Good. thank you also from uh, Jackson Paul team. My team, Mr. Amit Saxena, is the person behind the digital effort of. Uh, well done, Shama and Shipra. Thank you. Yeah. And I'd like to take your uh, attention to our uh, norethistron acetate tablets, which are called Cyclorex CR10 controlled release norethistron. Acetate, 10mg, cyclorex CR10. Then we also have Lycorid cell protector, which is uh, in Lycorid preg sachet of L-arginine DHA lycopene for high-risk pregnancies. 
and our age old injection maintain mm. for preterm birth and uh, habitual and threatened abortions mm. dipatron is our new product which is um, didrogestron 10mg tablets and uh, we thank you all very much for being here 